Jeremy Kenyon Lockyer Corbell. Thank Hello. you for joining us. All right, thanks for having me. You have so many names, I didn't know which ones I could skip and which I ones I had to hit, so I just decided <laughs> yeah. to go for all of them. My friends and enemies call me forename. Yeah. <laughs> That's great. Yeah, it's true. So you, last time we had you on, you were kind of just talking about moving out into, um, did you move out to the, what part of the desert? You're over in? Uh, yeah, Pioneer Town, California. Yeah. yeah. So deep Mojave up in the mountains. Mm -hmm. Pretty secluded, yeah. Super cool. And yeah. then um, also you were working on all of your artwork, which we can talk about here in just a bit. And you had, I think we're already kind of getting into uh, the citizens. Um, hearing on disclosure. Hearing yeah. on disclosure and also uh, running extraordinarybeliefs.com. That's right. Yeah, but you're coming to us today because you have a new movie coming out. I do. Which it's I can't exciting. Wait to hear about. Yeah. yeah. It's right. been so long. Tell us everything that's been going on because it's not just this, it's also like. You've got Skinwalker Ranch stuff coming up. You did an art um, art display tied into uh, Charles Manson and, um, oh my Sharon God. Sharon Tate. Thank yeah, you, Sharon yeah. Tate. I mean, less Charles Manson, more celebrating Sharon Tate. Way but, more, yeah. You know, that's how you connect the two. So tell me, what's, what's up? Yeah, so I've just been, since I saw you last, I've just been working hard. Uh, Extraordinary Beliefs is the you know banner that I work under and I do investigations into things that are extraordinary. People that are ordinary, that have extraordinary beliefs. I try to find people that are credible and have some sort of you know, thing that I can prove. And so this has been my work over, I mean, the last 10 years, but since we've talked. So a lot of those stories have broke for me. Mm -hmm. So everything from filmmaking to putting out my first major released movie, a mass released movie, which is Patient 17. Uh, yeah, it's been fucking wild and nonstop and exciting, yeah. Has there anything that happened that's really shocked you, like really shook you up? Yeah, yeah, for sure. Like uh, <laughs> <laughs> Don't tell us. No, I mean, like all, all of these investigations, they, they tend, you know, since I've gotten into them, they, they tend to evolve in pretty curious ways. So there have been, I, I was recently able to break a case and it's a military case and I was able to publicly break that case about a 2004 event off the coast of San Diego. The USS Nimitz, there was a, a whole fleet that was going out to battle and there was a, or going out to do deployment, and there was a series of UFO and USO events that are all on the record. It's something that we don't have all the documents on. I was tipped off before, couldn't talk about it for a few years, but was able to go kind of live with it when some of the footage got leaked from the FLIR camera from one of the fighter jets that went out. A tic-tac shaped object descending from 80,000 feet all the way down to 50 feet above the water and docking is the best word to use with some USO, unidentified submerged object. And our military thought it was a pretty massive threat. I mean, they, they responded as such mm -hmm. and documented these objects. All the fighter pilots that saw this object, the ones in particular that I'm speaking with, uh, said that it was otherworldly and we don't have the technologies. I mean, they tried to lock their planes onto it so they could fire if they needed to and this thing actively jammed all of our known hmm. top end radar and uh, weapon systems. So that was kind of shocking. That was kind of cool to be able to be on the front lines of that because I've been talking to people within the military for years before. I don't usually focus on military cases. This one kind of landed in my lap. Mm -hmm. But so that was fascinating. And then I got to spend time at Skinwalker Ranch, one of the what is creepy. Skinwalker Ranch? Oh my God! I don't man. know anything yeah. about it. I know only a light surface dusting on sure. what the deal is with Skinwalker. M most so. people that that's all they get because it was shrouded in secrecy. Uh, there is a guy named Robert Bigelow. Robert Bigelow is one of the wealthiest people. He owns Bigelow Aerospace, right? So he works with NASA, put inflatables onto the International Space Station called BEAM. It blows up habitats for humanity. So the guy basically is this really interesting dude. Made his fortune as a billionaire in uh, budget motels out of Las Vegas, Nevada. He pretty secretly bought a ranch. This ranch is known as a paranormal hotspot. There is more. Can I interrupt and ask a question? Yeah, please. Before he bought it, was it already known as a paranormal hotspot? The whole Uinta Basin, which is the, the Ute tribe that has a sovereign nation there, mm -hmm. uh, it goes back to pre-Civil War that there are these accounts of shadow people, beasts, creatures, UFOs, motherships, dimensional portholes. I mean, it's just, it reads like science fiction. The difference is, is that when a family bought that ranch and started to experience what was going on, they went to the Associated Press, or actually got picked up by the Associated Press, and they are like, something's going on, we're being run off our land, we think it's the government trying to freak us out. Well, it turns out Bigelow 
bought the ranch and he put seven scientists for seven years, we're talking Nobel Prize winning PhD level scientists. Mm -hmm. And they studied this ranch for seven years trying to document these events. And they, to, to some degree they were successful, mm -hmm. but all of this was private information. Well, my mentor George, in journalism, George Knapp, he is a, a two-time Peabody award-winning 27 Emmy journalist. The guy's a major journalist and he came out and was able to basically put little bits out about Skinwalker Ranch. He couldn't say everything because mm -hmm. Bigelow wanted it private, but he wrote a book called Hunt for the Skinwalker. And that book details every event that this group called NIDS, the National Institute of Discovery Science, owned by Bigelow, what they recorded, documented, and they were trying to hunt the phenomenon, as yeah. they call it. What's the point of Bigelow trying to do this? Well, okay, so at the time, it was his interest in UFOs. And so this whole area allegedly had these UFO encounters and all this stuff. But he quickly learned that it went far beyond UFOs, that the phenomenon itself is not confined to UFO activity. And having these great scientists on the ranch and being able to document it was a huge leap forward for studying these hot spots because they've been talked about for a long time. There are areas with high activity. And I can attest to you just from being there and speaking with local law enforcement, they take every call and every case seriously mm -hmm. because there have been repercussions when they haven't. Hmm. So everybody in the Uinta Basin has a story. They have seen everything from motherships to creatures. And you have to take it kind of seriously once you kind of understand that this is a, a real phenomenon. People are reporting this. So what is this phenomenon? What is it doing engaging humanity? And it, it, it is a big eye-opener if you read this book. And no one has ever been able to film mm -hmm. on the you know, tribal nation in that area. We were able to because of George Knapp's book and the, a scientist named Colin Kelleher, who also wrote the book with George. So we got interviews, we got that footage, we're going back, studying the ranch, and also just using journalism as a way to expose at least the human level, at least the, the psychological human level that people are reporting this. And they are shaken up, and there is physical evidence. Mm -hmm. hmm. You know, Wikipedia it mentions like everything from UFOs to Bigfoot-like creatures yeah. and poltergeist. Yeah, I well, guess I've never thought of or heard of a hotspot that had like. Well, I guess Griffith Park was kind of that same way. Yeah, like but, but everything, that was like you know? only. That was only. I feel like that's slightly different. Like that's like yeah. really sp specific things that are directly tied to the history of that spot, not just kind of a. a or wait, well, or where was it? We went somewhere where it was like aliens. Oh, maybe I'm thinking of uh, Catalina. Catalina was a little weird. That was like Catalina kind of had a lot, a mix a little, of everything. That's the first time actually on our Catalina trip that I had heard of, uh, prominently heard of um, the USOs. Yeah. Um, which, which apparently they've seen out there as well. USOs are actually uh, the key to all of this. It's just most people are not able to use submarines, that kind of thing. But mm -hmm. I mean, I was told by some of my contacts in the Navy that they track these all the time. Think about it, it's if this phenomenon is real, if there are unknown aerial vehicles or anomalous aerial vehicles piloted by non-humans engaging humanity since the beginning of recorded human history, mm -hmm. which is the premise, if that is true, then the obvious place to hide would be you know, in the oceans because these craft, if they do work the way that they're purported to work, it wouldn't matter what medium they go through. Let it be water, air, space, mm -hmm. it's all the same. It's gravity wave amplification. They can literally traverse space time. So it's really easy to move through these mediums. That's not necessarily what I believe, although it's pretty damn close. <laughs> uh, at this point, I don't have the luxury of disbelief. I mean, I've just been you know, really deep into this and, and talking with people and filming people for years now. Mm -hmm credible people, some of whom are high-ranking military officials, which somehow gives people credit, but every, you can be crazy on any side, right? But ultimately, I have people telling me their stories and letting me publish them, and there is physical evidence for a lot of this. We have radar reports. So without giving away what you're working on there, is there a way that you can tell us what some of your theories are as far as why is, why is it like a seemingly random spot on Earth suddenly a, a hot, hot spot? spot. Well, it's been a hot spot for centuries, if not, you know, for thousands of years. Mm -hmm. uh, but right now, we just have a very unique opportunity, which is to study uh, these events mm -hmm. from a different level because we have different technologies now. So, for example, there are cattle mutilations that go on on that property, and that was a big deal back in the day. I mean, there, Congress got involved at one point about the, the mutilation of cattle. They had so many theories, so many were being taken, they were being studied, genetically studied blood was being drained, there's no way that somebody could come up to these animals or strip the meat off. So on Skinwalker Ranch, this one cattle, it was like 25 minutes the rancher turns around 
and this th and they had a team jump in from NIDS and do the analysis so we can study that stuff biologically we can uh, we, we have a whole different way to study things now so it's a very exciting time uh, for the weirdness mm -hmm. and to be able to debunk it or to say hey there's something to this hmm. so can I ask what just what is the name skinwalker come yeah, from why is that's that that's important yeah yeah so s skinwalker it you know comes to Native American tradition and it essentially refers to a witch, a shaman, a trickster, uh, okay. or some sort of um, yeah, like a like a trickster, right? I was so just picturing like a Bigfoot or something. Right. Well, but the thing is, is, they can a... wear different skins. They can that that's the the lore. I don't know how that translates to, to physical mm -hmm. reality, but these events, as I kind of keep you know saying, is that they do leave trace um, elements. I mean, there there are things that happen that we or the scientific community can look at and that mm -hmm. to me is fascinating because mm -hmm. you're getting down to something is it it's not a matter of belief anymore is it true or not true it's not just witness testimony and that's what I'm interested in hmm. well so then that's a perfect segue to talk about patient 17 your new documentary about um, this gentleman that you met who was uh, had I don't know, what do you call it the Implants, I guess. Yeah, people call them implants. I say foreign body because yeah. I'm not convinced yet what that it is. An implant, yeah. yeah, somebody intentionally put it in, although it's seeming very fucking strange now. Uh -huh. But yeah, I met a guy, a, a doctor. His name was Dr. Roger Lear. He was a podiatrist, a foot doctor, but he spent about 20 years listening to people who said, "I have abductive experiences. I have this object. It's emitting frequency in my body." Uh, it was put in there by these non-humans. People say extraterrestrial, but I don't know they're extraterrestrial, by these non-humans, intelligences. And, uh, you know, we have John Mack at Harvard University, who's head of psychiatry. He took this very seriously. He said this is not a delusion, that the people that are experiencing this are experiencing a real phenomenon. He was a great voice in this field. Because of John Mack and the books he wrote out of Harvard about this, I had to kind of give it more credit. Mm -hmm. So I said to Dr. Lear, it was actually our common friend Ruben who introduced me to Dr. Lear, and I didn't want to touch it because I was focused on, you know, whistleblowers and people that... Ruben Langdon being yeah. Um, oh, yeah, yeah. my old friend, and then also he's been uh, one of our guests as totally, well on the show, yeah. I think a couple times now. Mm -hmm. He put on the citizen hearing uh, on disclosure, you know, 40 witnesses uh, from the intelligence community, astronauts, pilots at the National Press Club in front of five congressmen and one senator. So that was a very cool event. Ruben did that. I want to give him credit for that. And uh, anyway, so he told me to talk with Dr. Lear, talk to Dr. Lear, and I said, look, I don't really believe this shit. And I was like, if I point my camera at you, if you are twisting the evidence or dissuading the public towards truth, I or away from truth, I am going to out you. Are you sure you want me to do it? And he, and he said, yes. So I said, okay, mm -hmm. well, that's interesting. Mm -hmm. You know, so I went to the surgery, and I just thought it would be like a one-day thing, and I'd figure it out pretty quick that everybody's lying. You got r your real up close shots of that leg hole. I, I did. I did. Uh, I was you, like, you stomach it. Huh. Yeah. Now, and they're like poking around in there. I'm like, oh, I can't. I it. wanted to show <laughs> what, what the guy went through. I mean, you know, we're talking about this like it's somebody else. This guy's my friend now. I know him. Yeah. And, you know, they ripped open his leg and took out a big chunk of yeah. something. He, right, he right before, <laughs> right before he goes into surgery, you asked him. You're like are, something along the lines of like, are you nervous or whatever? And he tells you like how. His wife and or his girlfriend and his mom are like, just leave it, just leave it. Like you don't. And he's like, no, nah, it's gonna be a small incision, small incision. Next shot is literally like gaping oh on the leg gosh. hole, and I'm like, that's not a small <laughs> incision. Yeah, yeah. I mean, how he had the, pressure to not do it. Yeah. How do the people that have, how do they become aware that they have these implants? They I, have the memory of it being implanted, or has anyone just discovered I have this? and I don't know where it came from. Well, first of all, most people are just fucking crazy. And so <laughs> okay, they don't yeah. have an implant and they believe they do yeah. because it's you know cohesive with their worldview. But the people that Dr. That's Lear- That's an excellent way of saying that. Uh -huh. It, it yeah. is. Uh, but, but Dr. Lear, you know, he had these uh, you know, tests. So basically he'd put someone through a psychological uh, you know, exam and make sure that they're not fucking crazy. Mm -hmm. And then from there, he'd say, okay, you have abductive experiences. You think you have something in your leg. Get an x-ray, okay, it's denser than bone, so it's a foreign body. It's not something that should be in your body. Okay, cool. Then uh, he would essentially do a Gauss meter test, and this is, for me, trivial, but they'd run this electromagnetic frequency detector over and these things would ping. I mean, I saw it with my own eyes when it was in the guy's body, but again, it wasn't a controlled environment, so I can't really count that in as part of my study, but basically, he did that, and then all said and done, you get a few people that are eligible and if it's surgically, uh, if, if, if you can remove it surgically, then he, then he would do it or he'd mm. get somebody to do it. And uh, that's when it got weird. 
<laughs> yeah. So they did. They actually removed seventeen objects. From, oh, 17. 17. One out of patient seventeen. Oh, but yeah. But there was yeah. At, least, gotcha. at least seventeen objects. Some people had multiples. Yeah. But yeah, he went. You know, over twenty years, you're yeah. gonna whittle it down and get the right people and take them out and get them analyzed. And but never before have they had real hardcore scientific evidence that would prove any of their claims. Mm -hmm. You know, arguably. But that's what I was attempting to do with this film because you know that wouldn't that be fucking cool, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. you know? Yeah. Or you're like, this is bullshit, and yeah. then you're done, you know. Where do you kind of stand on it now? Well, now it's very interesting. I'm I'm all ears. Uh, I'm waiting uh, right now. So you'll see in my film when you watch it, we had what's called broad spectrum elemental analysis and isotopic analysis. Basically, what that means is you look at this object and you try to find out what is it made of. So the most complex alloys that we have will typically be four to five different uh, elements in it. I mean, nothing crazy. This had 36 elements inside this one tiny this piece. One tiny piece. Hmm. So all those elements play nicely together. It's kind of strange, some of which were uh, highly toxic, some of which were rare earth elements. So this is a highly fabricated, machined something that ended in his leg. Some people thought it was meteorite. Uh, he got hit by a micrometeorite. I was going to say, like, hmm. could that actually happen, though? I mean, we're, some, we're supposedly, yeah, we luckiest. being the Earth is supposedly bombarded by thousands of those a year, a day, or right. whatever. Could, yeah. But they got to land somewhere. Right, and most things do, or they disintegrate in our atmosphere. But yeah, sure, particulates end up all the time on Earth. That's why we can study the isotopes of meteorites. And we, st we study extraterrestrial isotopes, and why that's important Isotopes tell you origin to a degree. Mm -hmm. So if you have zinc, you have five, although four are studied, uh, major isotopes that have the same ratio if they're made on Earth, the same across the board. It is a ratio of isotope of zinc 64 that is common on this planet. If you get something outside 1% of that, you're like, oh, I probably got a meteorite mm -hmm. because it was made somewhere else. Well, this sample was far outside the terrestrial norm in the zinc 64. So somebody said, oh, okay, maybe it's a micrometeorite, hit him in the leg. Well, first of all, you got to be really fucking lucky to, to have that happen, right? Um, but I took it to the head meteorite uh, specialist at UCLA, mm -hmm. and it was definitively not meteoric iron. Ooh. So it is not a meteorite. It is a fabricated material, as far as mm. everybody can tell, from you know, uh, you know, material scientists to nanotechnologists. It is a fabricated material. Now, is it a chip? that tracks a human made by aliens. Right. <laughs> right, I have no idea, that's yeah. what their claim is. So where I stand on it now, it is a real fucking mystery. A yeah. And we're trying, my team and me, we're trying to get to the bottom of that and it'll all be open source. The results are already on my website. Interesting, so have you ever gotten somebody that's come along asking for your help or you've just had to turn them away because you're like, listen, this has nothing. Like every you're, damn you're, day. You're too <laughs> far off. Yeah, every damn day. Yeah. I don't know anything about penis implants. I mean, people are crazy. <laughs> I mean, they, so people, you people write up? you about penis implants often? Oh, yeah. Send me photos. <laughs> yeah. Strange dick pics. No, I mean, in all honesty, um, I'm joking around. It's SKD part two. That's right. <laughs> we've got a show. We've, we've got a thing that we want to push all about serial killer dicks being transplanted onto other people. Oh, wow. Yeah. yeah. Well, yeah exactly. Not to blow your oh, mind, wow. but to, uh, we're you know. pretty creative individuals over here. I, you know, so. I already got a sense of that. Yeah. You have, you have a nice set. I think you can get to the bottom of Bigfoot over there. I think so. But yeah, I mean, look, um, all joking aside, yes, I get uh, asked by people on a daily basis whether they're uh, government, military employees that have seen something. Uh, have been involved in a research project to simply somebody's mom who has a lifetime of uh, abductive experiences and doesn't know what to say about it. I recently got a call from a young uh, man who was serving in the Navy for quite some time and he saw something that totally blew his mind uh, of what this reality is and it was so shaking to him that he literally went on the internet, looked up UFO mm -hmm. and research and mm -hmm. investigator and found me and was disturbed about it, you know? Do you have a personal estimate on like how, what the average is on these things being actually legit UFOs versus just, um, you know, an airplane or some weird bird or something that, weather you know, a weather balloon or an odd reflection? Yeah, yeah. Depends, who, depends who's looking, but you know, the classic study with Project Blue Book, which is actually the predecessor to Project uh, Sign and Project Grudge, which were the military projects to look at the unidentified flying object thing, moved to become Project Blue Book. It was a public thing. It was largely created to discredit the topic because there was a tonality within our military that they wanted to demystify. Mm 
-hmm. the UFO topic because it was becoming a problem. When it became a problem was the 1952, I believe, flyover of Washington, D.C. Every magazine picked it up. All the teletypes stopped working. They got flooded with reports, and they saw this as a threat to national security. Mm -hmm. So they made a clear agenda to infiltrate the UFO community and to make a mockery of people that talked about it. But everybody involved to this day, if they're still alive, I've mm -hmm. talked to um, at least two of them, uh, this is a real phenomenon. It is occurring. Our military is quite aware of it, and so is the public, actually. And uh, they had, I think, 700, they had some over 700 unsolved cases, things that they couldn't attribute to these basic things that you just said. Mm -hmm. So I would say, you know, they say 5 to 10% are mm -hmm. real and actual. But uh, I also know a lot of these reports go completely unreported. A lot of these sightings go unreported. So where I'm at now is really simple. The UFO phenomenon is part of just the phenomenon that includes UFOs. There's a much bigger picture going on because when you talk with somebody and it doesn't matter what part of life, who they are, it's homogenous around the world. This is not something that just Americans are seeing or just, mm -hmm. you know, this is homogenous. So there is something that is occurring. It's been occurring since the beginning of recorded human history. It often manifests itself as lights. But when you talk with somebody and they say, I saw this, I saw a disc, I saw a craft, there's usually something behind that that they're not telling you because it is acceptable to say, I saw a flying saucer or a UFO. Like something that's yeah. more specific or weird. Right, and, like and it usually is more. To, yeah. It usually is more weird. And so the thing is, is when, when people get comfortable to move out of just telling you what they reported, you get this a lot with the military guys that tell you just what, what they saw. Mm -hmm. There's usually some sort of sociological or psychological impact that comes with that. If you've seen something, Mm -hmm. it's it's more common that you'll see something again and if you've had abductive experiences sure as shit your parents and your grandparents have too and mm -hmm. that's really? a weird thing and that's been studied very well seems to be genetic or familial yeah now you probably covered this when you were on our podcast before but how did you just initially get interested in all of this I was 13 years old, I heard on the radio George Knapp and Bob Lazar and Bob Lazar was telling his story of reverse engineering alien technology and the way he described it, the propulsion system, was absolutely like a, a flip from how I saw locomotion, the idea of moving something forward by pushing something back. This was falling into place by warping space-time with gravity wave amplifiers. It's the coolest story as a kid. You're like, I want this to be real. So that's how I got interested, is just hearing this story. Little did I know I'd end up making the definitive documentary on Bob Lazar, which is coming out in 2018. Mm -hmm. that's so cool. that you, is full you know, circle what, month for me. Yet, or is it kind no, of I'm just like... starting the editing process. Gotcha. Well, that's month. all you had to say. Yeah. I get it. We, yeah. we both get it. Start the editing process. We're like, uh-huh. Yeah. <laughs> but yeah. I, ha I have a deadline, and it will be out in 2018. Awesome. Cool. But that's that's how I got started, but I, yeah. all I did was talk about it, and at that time of the world, you know, every, you say UFOs, people are like, you're fucking crazy, so, mm -hmm. you know, just talk about it with people. Well, it's funny that you bring mm -hmm. that up, because I do feel, like you said, a lot more people are coming forward and talking about the fact that they've seen something, sure. and that the whole, like, if you saw a UFO, you're crazy, doesn't really hold the same kind of water that it did back in the past, because if you just look back to 20, 2016, uh, with the whole, like it was a running joke while while the president, like the run for the presidency presidency was happening. That you know, you get on a talk show and Hillary Cl Clinton is saying the first thing she's going to do is release, you know, UFO documents. Mm -hmm. um, granted, she put a little caveat in there, unless it was up against, uh, right. yeah, and military. Uh, and uh, and she secrets, also tried to give everybody a new term on that day. So it was Jimmy yeah. Kimmel. He's always pushed that, which mm -hmm. is great to thank Jimmy Kimmel for doing that. But basically. She came up and said, well, we, now we call them UAPs, Unidentified uh, Aerial Phenomenon. She was giving the public a search term for FOIA requests, Freedom of Information Act requests, right? Mm -hmm. But in fact, in intelligence circles, people call them AAVs, Anomalous Aerial Vehicles, or AATs, Anomalous Aerial Threats. So mm -hmm. there's all these terminologies that are better than UFO if you don't want somebody to look into FOIA and that kind of thing. But that was cool, and yeah, it's becoming popular. But recently... Do you think it's because they're going to... Like the government's going to drop a bomb on us? Everybody wishes that's the truth. But, you know, here's well, yeah. the... yeah. Everybody <laughs> wishes that's going to happen. Disclosure has already happened. You know, they are disclosing themselves, whatever this intelligence is, to a degree. And also, how do we know that our government really knows anything? That's not my information. That's true. It's my understanding that everybody's just kind of threatened because they don't know what it is. They've never really known. They get little bits and pieces and try to reverse engineer them, and there you go. Did you mm -hmm. see that new article that just, I think, dropped yesterday about the... Um, the the group of college 
students in Turkey making an announcement that, um, yeah, look this up really fast. I yeah. glanced at it briefly, but some something that there was a group of students in Turkey that announced that they that that they feel that the government is absolutely keeping all of this hidden from the public, and mm -hmm. that there's a whole a whole bunch of shady business behind it going on. Did you see that at all? I, I didn't, but we we know that we know that there has been uh, you know kind of cone of silence put mm -hmm. over this topic, as well as active you know mocking of this topic to dissuade the public from taking it seriously because it is one of the more important topics. This can be proved. There is a document trail for this. We have the documents in the public realm. So that is fact. It's not like a eureka moment. I'm glad that they're talking mm -hmm. about it. But it's something that if anybody just looks, they can see that this is in fact the case. Now there's a reason for that. You know, We want as America, let's say, a technological advantage in warfare. If we have a technological advantage, then we can be a superior technologically nation. And every government of the earth wants that. So when you get something and you don't know what it is, you don't know its potential for weaponization, mm -hmm. you keep it quiet and you figure out how to weaponize it first. Yeah. That's the mentality. But we're way beyond that. That was happening you know, during the time of the Roswell crashes, multiple, right? Mm -hmm. So now we're in a different era. And now you have people, you know, 25 years in the CIA, uh, just came out on stage with a, a guy from the Pentagon. This was through Tom DeLong, the musician. It was yeah. through his event. Mm -hmm. People look really harshly on this because they don't, I don't think they can look past Tom and that he's fundraising for a new company. But what happened on that day at that press announcement was pretty fucking epic. You have now, for the first time in history, we know, in the Pentagon, there was a guy named Lou, and Lou came on stage, and he says, I was in charge of the Anomalous Aerial Threats Department, and we have that in the Pentagon. I ran it for years, and we take this matter very seriously, and he basically, mm -hmm. and you can watch it, said, you know, I am a believer. These are not from here after what I've seen in the technologies, how they run circles around our craft and actually around our nuclear missiles. That's something that's well documented. We had 10 Minuteman missiles shut down at Maelstrom Air Force Base. A guy named Robert Salas was in the bunker at the time. These technologies came in, shut down our number one defense in mm. this world. I heard about this. Yeah, and there were multiples. They happened also in Russia at the mm -hmm. same time, and they happened on a second base in America at the same time. And then that new case I just told you, 2004, Nimitz UFO, type that in, tic tac. Everybody type that in, okay? Mm -hmm. You will hear and read about the case that I recently was able to break a lot of information on. It's crazy. This stuff is happening, and we need to acknowledge it. I found an article from this week that talks about a Turkish university that's offering now a major in UFOlogy. Oh, that's fucking or oh, great. Or and ET encounters. Yeah, it's that an article incredible. from this week. Well, well, I'll take a send me the link and yeah. I'll post it on it, our Facebook It should be page. studied scientifically. It should be studied in academic mm -hmm. circles. There is more evidence for UFOs than there is God, so we might as well look at it. It's <laughs> mm -hmm. a good statement. It's true. Um, so where do you think things go from here then? I mean, if 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 all of the the big technological push that we were exposed to that we've kept quiet and everything kind of happened back in the Roswell days, and now it's kind of um, doesn't have the same stigma necessarily. I mean, there's still stigma there, but not as aggressively as it was back in the day. Now, you know, you've got pre potential presidents making jokes about it and things of that nature. Where does everything go from here? Right, so a lot of presidents pushed for the UFO topic from JFK to uh, Nixon. One of the first things he did was try to um, you know, make stuff more available mm -hmm. in these black budgets and these programs to him. So every president I can think of, you know, Clinton, one of the first things he did was ask about both JFK, because he didn't want to be killed, and the yeah. UFO subject. So we've got presidents trying to be read in to these projects unsuccessfully. The president of the United States has been told no every time since Eisenhower. Eisenhower had the closest relation because he was actually a general. He was like, mm -hmm. I think, a three-star general. He actually was a military person. So he had more knowledge on this than other presidents after him. But if you think about that, all these presidents trying to get information and can't, where does that leave us? What, what, is, what is our ability to, to have clearance for that? So I'm not very hopeful yeah. that the government's mm -hmm. gonna serve up the, the, the alien saucer <laughs> on a crap, you right. know, on a platter. But I do think that every individual and what they do makes a, a difference. If you have a loud enough voice and you shake the cages, we can get somewhere. It's happened throughout history. There's mm -hmm. proof for that. So I think everybody 
kind of shaking the cages on this from their different angles, from scientific to spiritual to whatever. We need all kinds of people looking at this. I think that's what we do. I think we just keep talking about it and we put it as something that's important to us because if we're not alone, mm -hmm. and we're not, I mean, everybody knows how big the universe is, but everybody accepts that now. Most people accept that now. Mm -hmm. But if they're visiting here, doesn't that mean something? And it does. So let's find out. Do you have any um, thoughts on how it might tie into all the other theories out there that we're currently living in a sim? You know, I mean, I guess if you play The Sims, <laughs> in Sim City, aliens come and potentially destroy your city. Do they? Oh yeah, oh, that's awesome. Yeah, it's a random, it's a random disaster event that happens. Um, so I guess I just answered my own question. If we're living in a sim, well, yeah, a random disaster event is going but to occur. It brings up a really interesting <laughs> question, which is that you know that theory. I mean, Elon Musk is famous for saying it, but a lot of people are seriously talking about this in Silicon Valley right now. This is a big deal. You know, any advanced civilization at some point needs to forgo the physical body and create some sort of simulated reality, which will be just like our reality. Maybe we're living in one. Mm -hmm. Maybe we're living in someone else's. Here's what I know. I know that UFOs. The one thing we can say is that they represent a huge amount of power in a small amount of space, and this has been studied. So we know that. I mean, multi multitude of atomic bombs in the size of a softball, that, that's how much power these things you know, display. So we, we can test that. We know that to, to a high degree. So the question is, is what we're seeing purely physical, like craft from another star system? Mm -hmm. The evidence suggests not. The evidence suggests that what we're seeing is manipulated for us to see that this is a high intelligence, does make mistakes, but it's a high intelligence that is displaying to us this UFO phenomenon and that there's a lot more behind it, that it's coming in waves, if you track it over time, in the same pattern as any general learning curve, meaning there's something they want us to know mm -hmm. or to learn. So what is that? You know, I'm a quick learner, tell me. So that's kind of where I'm at is, let's find out more, uh, that if we just acknowledge it, and we say this is happening. Here are the radar reports. Here's the historical accounts. Here's the scientific data we have. Mm -hmm. Well, then we can start to face it and ask the real questions. What are we supposed to be learning from this? What does it mean? Of course, what's the threat? Uh, there's no threat or we would be gone. But that's what I want to know. So mm -hmm. be open about it and start talking about it. Interesting. Well, we've got 10 minutes left. Okay. Um, is there anything, do you want to touch base about what you've got coming up for Bob Lazar that, you know, without having to give too much away? or Let me just like tell that? you the, the quick note of Patient 17, which is that this movie I never thought was something that I would do. Mm -hmm. I fell in love with the project by meeting the subject, Patient 17 himself. He's a normal guy of uh, unnormal height, six foot nine or something. <laughs> He's a oh giant God. of a man. That's yeah. Tough. And uh, he has a real mystery in his life, and I'm trying to help him solve it. We're trying to get to the bottom of it. I'm doing scientific research for it, but if you watch the film, Patient 17, it's on iTunes, Amazon, Xbox, Vudu, all that stuff. It'll be coming out too in other forms. Basically, <laughs> if you watch that, you kind of get caught up on this particular mystery. And there will be more coming out through my website and such on this case. Mm -hmm. And then, yeah, Bob Lazar, like, if you don't know who Bob Lazar is, please type in his name. It's not that many letters. <laughs> wow, this is a guy reverse engineered alien craft at a sub base of Area 51 called S4. He is the only person ever to get out of that kind of facility and have some evidence that he did work there. Hmm. Whoa, okay. Yeah. And there will How be more How has he not been out. murdered yet? There w that's why he came out. That's why he came out in 1989 with George Knapp on KLS News in Las Vegas. Yeah. Was because his life was under threat. Mm -hmm. Oh, they were yeah. coming after him. And it protected him. Whoa. Yep. And people don't believe his story for X reason, Y reason. At least have a good reason. But the thing is, is that uh, he's telling you the truth. Mm -hmm. And I think most people are going to see that. My film's just going to lay out the evidence and the facts. And then it's up to everybody else to decide. So that's to look forward to. But... Find out who Bob Lazar is. Mm -hmm. Go deep down the rabbit hole. Pick out all the things that why you think he's lying so that we can get to them in the film. Hmm. Are you ever worried about yourself? No, no. I've never been um, threatened, never been stopped, only been assisted. Everybody has helped that's me. That's awesome. It's crazy. See, that's what you don't hear very often. So right. it is nice to actually hear that. Yeah. That's the experience. There p everybody fucking bullshits. There is, seriously, there, there are so many people running around saying, you know, I'm under threat. Oh, this, sensitive, this is sensitive information. I've briefed X, Y, and Z people, and they're fucking lying. Hmm. All, the, the government doesn't need some Joe Schmo who pretends he's a doctor to, to, <coughs> to go ahead and 
you know, brief people. Basically, they have their own self-contained system. So what I'm saying is, if, if someone's coming at you like that, most likely is total bullshit. However, there are some times are documented where the United States military has literally run people into the crazy farm with this. There's a, there's a really famous case with a guy named Richard Doty who worked uh, Nellis Air Force Base and he worked, sorry, it's Kirtland Air Force Base and he worked uh, for our government and he basically drove a man mad by giving him false information that he was already on to. So mm. that stuff does happen. Hasn't happened to me, I don't think. Okay. You don't think. Well, <laughs> I don't, you're the judge of sanity. I'm not, you oh, have pickles me? in your tree. Yeah, no. exactly. You know? Yeah. I am the worst person to make that call. <laughs> That's what we love about you. <laughs> that is it for Bizarre Estates. Uh, big thank you to Jeremy for coming back. Thanks for having me, you guys. Always. It's really cool. Thank I love you. your setup here. Thanks Thanks for having me. Yeah, no, my pleasure. Um, you can find Patient 17, like he said, on iTunes and pretty much anywhere else that digital distribution is going on. And uh, keep an eye out back in uh, 2018. It seems so weird to say that. 2018. I know, but it is around the corner. In the future. Uh, 2018 for the Bob Lazar stuff. Yeah, and all my work can be found at extraordinarybeliefs.com. Like every single series that I've created is all right there. So Perfect. check it out. Have a wonderful day, and we'll see you guys next week. Bye. Bye. <laughs>